on grounding, which uh, which uh, which were very inspiring in in many of the projects uh, I did subsequently. Um, so yeah, so 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 today I'm I'm going to to make a presentation where I'm going to to talk about basically two topics. One is language grounding, and the other one is uh, curiosity driven learning. And maybe one of of my objectives today is to highlight. Uh, what I've been, what I believe is a very strong relationships with, between those two concepts, um, uh, and, uh, and 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 I will in particular uh, talk about one particular form of curiosity driven learning, which uh, uh, we call autotelic. Uh, but I will explain what what it means. It's it's kind of a new word that 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 we are using to uh, to, to name a number of uh, processes of exploration and learning. Um, so, uh, there are many different forms of language grounding that, that people have been discussing uh, in various places in the scientific literature, both in cognitive sciences, in uh, language sciences, in, uh, in AI, in machine learning. Uh, one of uh, the forms of, of grounding that people have been discussing uh, is could be basically summarized uh, as a multimodal grounding, and that's the idea of um, learning to associate, uh, on the one hand, a space of symbol with, with on the other hand, uh, uh, structures in an ex existing in another modality, for example, vision or touch. Um, and so, for example, a number of projects uh, in AI have investigated how a machine uh, could learn to associate sequences of letters to particular uh, images, uh, sounds, and videos, uh, or patterns of touch, if we are, uh, for example, speaking uh, uh, with a robot. Uh, but this form of grounding, uh, as, as you may note, is not... Um, associated to any particular functionality of a language. It's just association. And another form of grounding is actually more focused on understanding uh, how language uh, can be used as a tool for doing uh, things in collaboration with others. Uh, for example, for learning to solve tasks in interactive settings, for example, uh, in a group where you need to, 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 to use language to, to get other people to do something that will help you and them do uh, achieve a task collaboratively. Uh, and sometimes language is also functionally used as a tool, not only to do tasks with others, but, but to do tasks with oneself. Uh, it can be used, for example, as a, to, as a cognitive tool to, to, to plan, to imagine uh, uh, potential routes and ideas, uh, to conceptualize, to abstract. Uh, but still, uh, as a tool that in the end is helpful to solve actual problems in the external physical environment. And this kind of, of use of language, learning to use language uh, as a tool to solve tasks, is what we may call uh, functional grounding. And today, uh, I'm going to particularly focus uh, on the, the idea of functional grounding and, and how actually uh, uh, learners, whether they are children or machines, can come to discover the functionalities of language as a tool and thus achieve a form of functionality, functional grounding. Um, but interestingly, I, I, I came to investigate uh, this kind of question by first doing a, a project a, a long time ago that were more related to uh, learning associations, so, so rather multimodal grounding. And so like around 20 years ago, I was working uh, in the group of Luke Steels. Um, and basically we were uh, trying to model various phenomena associated to uh, the self-organization of linguistic conventions in, group, in groups of agents. And that was work done in the, in the context of the scientific community of language evolution, where we are trying to understand how languages form in groups of individuals without centralized control. And so one of the main questions is how a group of agents, for example, can agree on a, of a system uh, on a system of association between, for example, a set of symbols and a set of reference uh, out there in the external physical world. Uh, Thierry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I forgot to ask you, are you <laughs> do you take questions during your talk or only after? 
Uh, okay, so I, I I'm open to question during the talk, but but I have a lot of things to say, so probably it 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 might be better for me to to have a chance to reach the end if if we keep the question for the end. But if you really have burning questions, uh, that that's also completely okay to <laughs> to ask okay. them. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, please. Um. And so, uh, and so, for example, in the talking and experiment, we were using what what was called language games. And so, like those agents, they would play some kind of games where they would try to have the another agent guess uh, uh, the meaning of a word. And so, for example, one agent would say "wabadu," and the other agent would try to point uh, with an embodied system to one of the reference out there in the world. Uh, and then the first agent uh, was saying, okay, yes, that was the object I was thinking of. And I was saying, no, that was not the object. That was this one. And it was, it was pointing to another reference. And, and then there was mechanism so that they would update they the, the hypothesis uh, of the association between symbols and, and categorizations uh, and, con and, and conceptual categorization uh, across with time. And we were trying to understand how at the level of the group there could be some kind of synchronization happening. And we were finding, we, we did find models explaining very interesting phenomena at the level of the group. For example, explaining how systems of words for colors or shapes would emerge and would actually have similarities with with the with the words for colors and and the con and the system of uh, of conceptualization of colors in the world languages, um, and and we we had similar actually models for for the origins of speech sounds like vowels and consonants, but in all of those models there were a number of assumptions that were kind of hand programmed uh, in in those machines. So for example. Uh, those machines were hand programmed to play these games all the day, and so it means that first of all they they like were high, hardwired to understand how to play the game. So like it was hardwired that like when they heard some kind of linguistic utterances from the other one, it was meant to refer to an external object in the outside world. So kind of they they kind of were programmed to understand the, the functionality of. Uh, an acoustic an utterance like it, it was made to to drive the attention towards something out there in the world uh, and also they were kind of pre-programmed to be kind of motivated to want to play this kind of communication game all the day long and so i be, be started to 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 investigate what could be the origins of 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 those things we would program in those models so for example what what could be the origins of a motivation for systematically exploring uh, a language game with others. And this led me progressively to a more general question uh, about uh, child development. When, when children uh, explore and learn uh, during their development, uh, they, they acquire a wide diversity of skills beyond language. They learn how to locomote with their body. They learn how to, to grasp and manipulate objects. They learn how to do bicycles. They learn uh, how to play video games, they learn how to do mathematics, they learn how to do music, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and, and for all these skills, and language is one of them, they really need to practice uh, to, 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 to become proficient in those skills. And is there some kind of specific motivation that's pre-programmed that triggers at some point to get them explore systematically, for example, how to locomote? Uh, on four legs, then to locomote on two legs, then to to learn to grasp objects in various ways, then to learn to to play with certain kinds of toys, etc. Or are there maybe more general principles that that lead them explore all 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 those skills? And and this is what led me on the track of exploring the concept of curiosity, which is some kind of everyday language, every, everyday world that 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 uh, that covers all kinds of exploration exploratory behavior we observe in children, but also in uh, in 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 humans of every age, and also in, in many other animals, uh, uh, and, and and even sometimes in in plants uh, uh, in the living world. And and then I I began to investigate the question of of uh, what could be the mechanism uh, of curiosity and learning of curiosity and exploration and, and and how they could en enable an organism to progressively discover how to to manipulate their own body to understand and to model their own body the interaction between their body and the environment and then discover uh, and learn the interaction with others and as a particular case uh, discover language and so. 
that's basically uh, the general perspective I, I'm, I'm going to to discuss uh, to discuss today, um, and 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 I'm going to, and I'm going through progressively going to be through a number of projects uh, of of uh, higher complexity in that direction. Something I forgot to say also in that picture is that. Uh, at the same time, curiosity seems to play a very important role uh, in getting infants uh, and children explore and, and learn about the world. But the social environment also uh, plays a very important role in guiding them. And at some point, when they become able to understand and to take advantage of social guidance, there are uh, rich forms of social gu guidances conveyed in particular by language that are going to be very helpful in sculpting their development and driving their curiosity. And so the general idea that I'm going to illustrate also today is that on the one hand, curiosity may be a fundamental mechanism that gets children to progressively discover language and how it can be used functionally to solve tasks in the world and vice versa, how language can be used as a tool that's not only used uh, by children to communicate with others, but also to, 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 to be used as a cognitive tool to uh, conceptualize and learn and explore more efficiently the environment. Okay, so let's discuss about curiosity. So curiosity and, 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 and another related concept uh, which psychologists have called intrinsic motivation, which pushes basically uh, humans to explore, not because they want to get food or social recognition, but because they are searching for, for things like novelty or surprise. So, so, so this kind of concept, they were already uh, hypothesized uh, by some scientists uh, 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 in the previous century, for example, in the 40s and in the 50s, uh, scientists like Berlin, White or Kagan, uh, and many others, they made the hypothesis that it's impossible to explain uh, children exploration only uh, through uh, extrinsic motivation, such as finding food, avoiding uh, uh, danger for the body, uh, getting social recognition. They, they, they really like observe that probably the brain has some form of neural circuitry pushing them to uh, to explore activities for the mere pleasure of experiencing novelty, surprise, cognitive dissonance, optimal challenge. Uh, so they use various words like these ones. But actually, the theories, they remain pretty verbal, pretty vague, uh, if I can say, until uh, relatively recently. But things be began to change uh, around 20 years ago, where a number of labs in the world, including mine, became uh, to 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 introduce the topic of curiosity in more natural sciences and trying to understand what could be the like the the the, the brain and the behavioral mechanisms underlying those intuitions that uh, psychologists would have uh, in in the previous decades, um, and 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 so we 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 first uh, for a number of years tried to build uh, an interdisciplinary community across neuroscience psychology. Uh, AI, um, uh, educational sciences, and trying to build a common vocabulary. vocabulary and, and actually, a lot of progress could be made. And some of the of the main framework that many people in this community have been using as a way to organize thinking about uh, curiosity uh, has been uh, to see the child as a kind of a little scientist. Uh, so that's not, by the way, a very novel idea. Jean Piaget already, for example, uh, proposed uh, a similar perspective and many others, but 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 that's the perspective on which we are building the ground. And so when you see the child as, as a little scientist, there are basically two loops that are very interesting to look at. One loop is, is a loop where the child, for example, those children, they decide to make an experiment, for example, mix, mixing up chemicals of different colors. Then they make predictions about what could happen. They do the experiments, they observe what's happening. And then in general, uh, they might not always get it right. And so they observe errors in their prediction and, and they use these errors as a feedback signal to update their model of the world. Uh, uh, and, and, and what's interesting is that uh, there is a, another loop on top of this one, which is a, a meta learning loop or a meta cognitive loop that's going to be used as a way to help uh, or to guide children in deciding what kind of experiment could be interesting to do in a particular moment uh, of, of their exploration of their learning. And so in this higher level loop, there will be typically some form of meta model that basically uh, tries to estimate in what parts uh, the, the internal model of the world that the child is building 
is being good, is being bad, is being is being highly uncertain or more certain, uh, makes learning progress. Uh, so various kinds of measure measuring the the proficiency of 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 the internal world model to account for the external world, and then derive from this meta model a, a number of measures of interestingness that are then used by an action selection system that that you could see like as a form of reinforcement learning system, but that's not getting reward from the outside world, but but reward generating inside the brand. Uh, like measures of interestingness that are going to 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 guide the brain to decide what kind of experiment to make in certain context. And so, what's also interesting to note is that there are several kinds of experiment that that, for example, humans can make. That there are prediction experiments, like this is what the example I was mentioning with these children. Like they they, they imagine some kind of action to do in the world and they try to predict the outcome. But then there is another kind of experiment that's extremely important and useful, uh, illustrated by, by those children on the right. Uh, here, they are not uh, imagining in advance a particular action and trying to predict the outcome. Rather, they are imagining uh, a goal they might be able to reach or are trying to reach um, in, in the next few minutes, for example. And so they might say to children, oh, maybe we could try to build a tower that's three meters high, for example. Um, and 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 basically, they are projecting a future configuration of 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 the world, and 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 trying to use their current world model to uh, to find out the sequences of action that may lead to that goal. And then when they set that goal, they they try a sequences of action toward that goal, and then they can measure. Uh, uh, how close they are from reaching the goal af after a certain budget of time. And then they use this uh, measure of discrepancy uh, as, as a signal to update their model of the world and their meta model of the world. And actually, uh, so this talk is not really about various forms of curiosity and exploration and, and their relative advantages. So I'm going to take a shortcut and, and just say that uh, a, a whole series of work on these different forms of curiosity led us to discover that um, uh, forms of exploration which are organized around setting goals uh, for a certain amount of time and sequencing goals that are self-generated and self-pursuing goals is a very important form and very efficient forms of, of exploration for discovering things in the world. And this is what we have been calling autotelic exploration. So from the world, the Greek word telos, goal, and auto, self. So self-generation of goals, self-exploration of, of, of goals. Um, and so in the past few years, uh, even in the past decade, we've been trying to build actually artificial intelligence models of autotelic learning agents. Uh, so curiosity-driven exploration, that curiosity -driven exploration agents that explore by setting for themselves goals. And so the, the typical steps uh, that are followed in most of the models of autotelic agents are the following ones. So there is a first step where... Uh, uh, the agent is internally sampling a goal given an internal way to represent a space of goals that, that can be learned through interaction with the world. Uh, and that's also associated with a measure of interestingness uh, that's going to guide the sampling of goals. Then in a second step, uh, there is a step where budget of time is allocated for pursuing the goal uh, to, to, to be achieved in the outside world. Then there is a, a step which will be about self-evaluating how much the trajectory that's generated by pursuing the goal is, enables to actually achieve the goal. And again, the idea is that it's the agent itself which is internally generating uh, uh, an internal reward function about how much it's being able to achieve the goal. So actually, in many of the models we, we work with, the representation of goals is actually associated to a measure to to, uh, to to that enable to uh, to measure achievement of the goal, and then based on, uh, on 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 this evaluation, various kinds of internal models are updated. Uh, for example, the policy to reach goal is updated, and this can actually also benefit from an important form of learning, which is hindsight learning. So hindsight learning, imagine for example, uh, an agent. Uh, a baby or a robot in front of a table with various objects and imagine in its head the goal of moving uh, an object on the right. It tries a movement. It misses uh, uh, moving the object on the right, but by chance the object moved on the left. And so after the trajectory, he says, I missed moving the object on the right, but if my goal would have been to move the object on the left, I just found an example of how to do that. 
Uh, and if you use this kind of hindsight a posteriori learning, it makes this kind of loop extremely powerful because even if you sample a goal that you don't know yet how to achieve, you might quite often discover as a side effect how to solve other goals on the road. Uh, so, so four steps, sample a goal, perfect goal, evaluate performance, update internal model, and you repeat that uh, uh, many, many times. And that's the loop of autotelic exploration. And that's the loop I'm going to 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 use, and we, that will be underlying uh, many of the experiment and model I, I will describe uh, as a follow up. Just uh, a small detail on one of those steps here, uh, which is the goal sampling strategy, because we've been working in particular in that in that part uh, and trying to understand the question of of what can be interesting for the brain to decide what's an interesting goal what's an interesting learning activity. And so there are many hypotheses that were generated here and there in, in, in the literature. Hypothesis, for example, related to what's interesting is activities where there is a lot of surprise, where there, there is a lot of prediction errors. But actually, if you try to build machines that you program to be interesting in this kind of situation, you will discover very quickly they will do things that are very strange. For example, you will, you will discover the robot uh, spends the whole day doing strange movements, staring at a window. Uh, and then if you open the brain, because this is what you can do with a robot, uh, you will discover that what it's trying to do is actually trying to control uh, the color of the shirts of people coming by in the streets or the color of the cars. Uh, and indeed, you've programmed the robot to explore and focus on situations where its prediction errors are maximal. And indeed, in that case, there is no link between the movements and the colors of people, shirts, or cars passing in the streets. Uh, and so that's a perpetual source of prediction error. So the, the robot is doing exactly what you asked it to do. Uh, and indeed, the world is pretty rich. Uh, and the robot is not supposed to know that there is no causal relationship between those two things. And so it's 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 just doing what, what you asked it to do. And so the children, obviously, are not doing this. They are doing exploration that's much more uh, organized, much more structured. And so one of the... Uh, hypothesis that we've been proposing and exploring for, 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 for some time is the idea that the brain is very interested by goals and learning activities in which it is experiencing learning progress. And so the idea here, let's imagine there are four dif different kinds of abstract goals or learning activities. Uh, and imagine that time is spent exploring each of them. Uh, and here uh, on the x-axis, it is time. And on the y-axis, it's the evolution of empirical errors for achieving those goal types. Uh, and since we see that there are three activities in the beginning that are very difficult, uh, and one that is very easy, and so the one that is very easy remains very easy, and among the ones that are very difficult, one, the, the red one, uh, remains very difficult to control, and so no, no progress is made. And so that may be a bit like this robot trying to control the color of cars in the street. And two others are actually difficult initially, but then progress is being made at different rates. Uh, and so the learning progress idea is that the brain is going to be interested in exploring those activities or those goals where the derivative of this curve is maximal. And so in the beginning, since the brain does not know in advance the shape of those learning curves, it might explore and sample a little bit those different goals to make a model of how much progress is being made and very quickly discover that, for example, here, the, the black one is the highest source of learning progress, and you might focus on that one until it reaches a learning plateau. And then at this point in time, the gray, the green one becomes most interesting, and so it shifts automatically to the green one, while at this, at, at all times avoiding to, to spend too much time on the blue one or the red one. But still exploring them a little bit, because maybe the red one is just very, very difficult, and maybe you need to acquire things uh, that are a bit simpler before you make progress. And maybe it's by exploring the green, the green activity that you might acquire those skills. Uh, and so as you see, this, this idea enables to generate automatically a form of learning curriculum from simple to more complex activities while keeping with activities that are neither too easy nor too complicated. So there is kind of an active uh, control of the growth of complexity of learning, learning activities. And so this is an idea that's also going to be in a number of the models and experiment I'm going to present. So here is the sequence of models and experiments I'm going to present today. Uh, and, and, and now comes the link with the language because they will all in some way be connected to, uh, to, 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 to discovering language. 
So the first experiment I will uh, present is about uh, trying to model vocal development, so speech development, uh, through curiosity-driven driven exploration. In that experiment, speech uh, will be a purely sensory motor activity and will not yet be associated to any kind of functionality related to communication, for example. Then in a second experiment, I will present uh, how this, exactly the same set of curiosity-driven autotelic exploration algorithm can enable uh, a, a complicated body, like uh, the body of a humanoid robot, to progressively discover uh, uh, how certain objects can be used as tools to manipulate other physical objects. Then I will use those same algorithms to do experiments in environments where the, the, the curiosity-driven agent uh, is not only surrounded with physical objects, which it could discover, but also with other special kind of objects, which happens to be social peers, uh, which, are, which have special affordances. And then I will show how curiosity-driven exploration might allow the learning agent, the learning baby agent, to progressively discover that certain movements it can do with his body, such as moving a vocal tract, produces actually speech sounds that uh, can have effects, controllable effects on uh, those special objects that we call social peers. And so that's basically uh, the origins of discovering uh, how speech waves can be used as tools to control others. The basic discovery of the functionality, the, the, the more prime, primal forms of the uh, of functionality of language is this then still go a bit... still talking about vocalization uh, is yes. this... at this point in time uh it's it it's still vocalization uh but then in the next experiment we'll go a little bit higher in the hierarchy and we'll suppose that like agents already master the vocal tract and uh, we'll abstract a little bit the 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 sound wave uh, uh, modality and we'll go directly to like sequences of uh, letters if you want uh, and we'll consider uh, how curiosity driven autotelic agent interacting with uh, again a social peer that will be a little bit more elaborate that will be able to provide a linguistic description of behavior so how autotelic agent can internalize those linguistic description and use them as cognitive tool to organize their exploration in a more abstract uh, and creative way then uh, uh, I'll observe that those these first experiments on using language as a cognitive tool will be done with a social peer, which still have a relatively simple uh, complexity in terms of language. And so we'll use to a similar experiment where we, we are going to replace a very simple handcrafted model of the, of the social peer and of language we are more, we, with a more complicated, much more complicated model of language. And here we will leverage lar large language models. And we will explore the idea of how Totelic agent can use large language models as kind of a model of internalized language from social peer. And so how they can use them as cognitive tools to organize curiosity-driven exploration. But then at this stage, I will try to explain you that here, the language model that I use, they are fixed. And, and, and the way they were trained was in such a way that they were not at all connected to any particular environment. And so in a way, they were not grounded in, in, in any particular way with those environments. And so I will ask the question how we could shift uh, the use of those language models in such a way that they are going to be put in direct interaction with the environment. And we are going to see how some machine learning algorithm can be used to progressively align and update them so that uh, their internal representation are going to be uh, updated so, so that they can be used to actually help agents to solve tasks in the interactive environment. And and that that and that will uh, finalize my discussion uh, of of functional grounding uh, of language. Of course, there are many topics that are related to that. I will not talk about, but but I will try to go through those steps. So as you see, there are many steps. So I'm going to go fast in each of those steps just to give you the general idea of, of the thinking of the project project we are we are working on uh, in my lab. 
So first experiment, that's going to be about using uh, curiosity-driven exploration to understand how uh, speech can be discovered by agents. So here we use uh, a physical simulator of the vocal tract, um, a, phys uh, a, a physical model of an auditory system, uh, and then in, 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 in the middle, uh, uh, um, a model of a neural network uh, uh, associated with a cursive and exploration system that's going to enable uh, those simulated agents to imagine auditory goals. So auditory goals are imagine, imagine trajectory in the acoustic space uh, or in the auditory space. Uh, and then, uh, so those systems, they will actually be driven to select auditory goals for which they make maximal learning progress in terms of discovering the motor programs that drive them to produce those goals. And those goals, they can actually sample uh, in some kind of uh, space that, 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 that is kind of completely free, but they can also decide these agents to sample as goals uh, existing uh, sounds from a simulated speech systems in, in a population of social peers around those learners here, which simulates like a baby uh, exploring its vocalization in an environment where there is also an existing language, which, which it's given vowel system, it's given consonant system and syllables. And then it, it has the freedom to choose or not to try to imitate those sounds based on how much it makes learning progress. And what we observe is that by using these learning progress based or totalic exploration. There is a self-organization of developmental stages in vocal exploration, like the transition from uh, discovering how to phonate. Actually, most of movement of the vocal tract don't produce any sound at all. So first of all, it's about discovering how producing uh, a, a pitch sound. And then there is a transition from unarticulated sounds, so things like ar, ar, ar to, to more uh, articulated sound that correspond to what's been called canonical babbling, like ba, 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 ma, ma, ma. And then a transition from a first phase where agents vocalize in a way that's not influenced by external speech sounds already in the population. And actually that's because they don't make any learning progress at this point in time to, to imitate those sounds. But after a while where they've acquired the basic building blocks to make progress, now they shift uh, and, and they imitate, they decide to imitate more often those external sounds because now they have already the, the building block that enable to make them progress. And so those transitions happen to be very similar to the transitions that we observed in the vocal development of human infants uh, in, in, in the diverse world languages that we know around. And another similarity is that with this kind of model, we can also reproduce uh, something we know with infant vocal development is that there is a duality between regularities most of infants go through uh, certain stages uh, that are very frequent, but there are also infants that go through much more rare developmental trajectories. And here in, in those models, if we simulate many times this kind of system, we will, we will ex with exactly the same parameters, get at the same time statistical regularities and sometimes emergence uh, of very different development of tra trajectories. It's because it's like a dynamical system with various attractors of various sizes. And, 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 and because there is stochasticity, uh, most of the trajectory correspond to the main attractors, but sometimes the system will fall in more diverse attractors. Let's move to the next experiment. So here the experiment is gonna use exactly the same underlying autotelic exploration alg uh, algorithm, but the embodiment will be changed. And here the embodiment will be a complicated humanoid body. Uh, and, and the space of goals that this humanoid will be able to explore is basically the principal trajectories of various objects in the environment. For example, uh, movements of the hand. The hand initially is just one object among others. It doesn't know it has something, anything special. Uh, it, it doesn't know an a priori notion of uh, self versus non-self, for example. Uh, moving various uh, uh, objects around like, like joysticks. So let's, let's look at a, at, at a video at a video that's where we're going to see a number of things that, that this robot do. So initially, basically the robot is going to be able to try to sample goals about various object environment. Uh, it will try to move the yellow ball, to move uh, the lamp, to move uh, like the, 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 yellow, the yellow toy on the left that you can see here. Um, but very quickly, it will, it will discover that in the beginning, the kind of objects for which imagine trajectories, uh, which he select as goals, for which he makes maximal learning progress, is actually the hand. So 
you will actually discover that it's more uh, profitable in terms of learning progress to set goals about moving the hang early on, and you will focus on that. So here we see some kind of visualization internally about the learning progress, about moving various objects in varian environment. So that's the hand here. And so by focusing on the hand, it will increase the diversity of movements about the hand. And as a side effect, you will discover that the hand can be used to actually move uh, th those two joysticks in front. And actually very quickly discover that one of the two joysticks does not is not very rich, it does not control anything, but one of the other joystick is actually uh, producing movements of, of the little white toy in front of this object. And so very quickly discover that selecting the white toy as a space of gold, like imagining various kind of target movements of the white toy becomes a, a source of learning progress and it will focus on exploring movements uh, that move the, the hand so that it moves the joystick and it moves the white, the, the white toys in the right, in the right way. And then he discovered that actually the white one can be used to push uh, the yellow ball in various directions. And now the yellow ball becomes a source of learning progress. And he, he focused on, on setting goals about moving the, the yellow ball in various directions. And so in a few dozen hours, this actually system is going to discover a wide diversity of skills in this environment. Uh, actually, even skills that we were not expecting, like like what we see right now, actually discovers how to hide the ball from the environment and from its camera system, um, and 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 basically it means that this autotelic learning system has got to mean to discover how to use object in the environment uh, as tools to manipulate further object in the environment. And we've been doing a number of more simple experiments also to, for example, compare various, various properties of uh, uh, to, uh, to the development of, of tool use in infants. I'm not going to give details about that, but just to mention that we also find similarities with uh, human tool development. And then... In another set of experiments, we've tried to combine the, the two experiments uh, I, sh I, sh I showed you before. Uh, 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 one of those experiments, which is actually shown in this video uh, that we call the playground experiment, is an experiment where the, the robot you see in the center is actually equipped with a number of motor primitives that enable it to make various movements with the body, but also he is also equipped with a simulated vocal tract, very simple, but still it's a simulated vocal tract that enables him to produce vocal sounds. So uh, here you don't hear actually sounds, but right now when you see it opening the, the mouth like this, it's, it's actually producing sound. And initially it's trying to learn how to control various kinds of objects around and it doesn't know which part of its, of its action system may be uh, useful to control those objects. And so what you just observed a few seconds before is this robot trying to vocalize toward this blue object uh, and it did not produce any effect, but it, initially the robot doesn't know. And so he tries to do it a number of times. He discovers that he makes no learning progress uh, and, he, and he stops doing that. On, on the other hand, he discovers that moving, uh, I'm, I'm going to go back uh, for a few seconds, but he discovers that, for example, yeah, like here, moving, uh, let's go back here, uh, using his leg to, to do this, uh, this kind of movement is actually more efficient to produce movement in this blue toy. So he's going to, to, to make this kind of, of, of discovery. And then later on, he's going to discover that, for example, the little object in front of it uh, may be grasped uh, by, by uh, uh, crushed, crouching down and opening the mouth with a certain pattern, um, like this one. And, and, and then later on, actually, we'll discover something that, that's initially a bit difficult to discover in this action space, but, but that he ends up discovering is that if he is actually turning the head towards the other robot and at the same time producing a sound, the other robot, which is a simulated social peer here, it's very, very simplified. It was programmed basically to imitate the sound of this robot when this robot looks toward this robot and producing a sound. Uh, so this is a very, very, very simplistic social affordance, but still this robot in the center at some point through the process of curiosity driven exploration gets that uh, a link between vocalizing and getting a special response from this special object. And he ends up discovering the skill of producing the other 
uh, special object, what we call a social peer, to produce certain kinds of behavior uh, in a controllable way. And so this kind of idea, we extended it in, in simulated setups where we complexify the, the, the social peer. And the social peer were, was basically modeled as an agent that would be able to move objects uh, in the environment, uh, potentially as a response to sounds produced by a learner agent. And so the learner agent here is also a humanoid-like agent uh, equipped uh, with the ability to move an arm and potentially interact with a various object on a table. And it has also a simulated vocal tract. And across, among the objects on the table, some of them are directly within the reach of the hand. And so he might learn to, 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 to directly play with the hand. Some of them are a bit further, but, but, but maybe uh, there, there are some objects like a stick that can be used uh, by the learning agent to, to get them closer and play with them. Uh, and some of the objects are further away. And then the social peer is programmed such that when the learning agent is actually playing with that one object, <coughs> the social peer is going to, to, to produce an acoustic sound, an acoustic sound wave, that it's is actually the name of the object being played with. And then the learner agent uh, is going to be able, like the vocal uh, exploring agent we saw earlier, to decide to practice how to imitate the speech sounds uh, of, of this social peer. Uh, and then he's also going to be able to decide to produce this speech sound and just observe the reaction of this social peer. And so what we observe here again with the same autotelic exploration architecture, is that this learning agent will progressively discover that initially what's easiest to learn and focus on in terms of learning progress is moving the hand around, then it will explore how to move the, the objects that are close around, then it will explore how to move the stick around and play it with objects that are a bit further, then it will try to explore producing certain vocal sounds that uh, that look like the vocal sound of the social peer. And then at some point, it will, it will be, begin to discover that producing certain kinds of sounds produce certain kinds of effects in the social peer, such as the social peer, uh, when the learner produces the names, the sounds corresponding to the names of objects, it makes the social peer push the object towards the learning agents. And so it will, at this point in time, make the learning agent discover that the good strategy to learn to play with objects like object three, which is far away, is actually to use the production of speech sound as a tool to get the social peer move the object closer to play with them. And so that's really the discovery of the, of the functionality of language as a tool to get others do things uh, and, and solve tasks of interest in the physical environment. Okay, so let's move a little bit higher in the abstraction hierarchy. Um, language uh, uh, has not been thought and conceptualized only as a tool for communicating with others. But there are a number of psychology, one of them being Lev Vygotsky, who has explored a lot the idea that language can also be internalized as a cognitive tool that's uh, helpful for building abstraction, using those abstractions to plan and make higher level mental simulations about the world, help generate novel ideas, uh, help reasoning. Um, and, and this is a line of research we've been trying to explore, a line of ideas we've been trying to explore in the context of curative and exploration. And in particular, we've tried uh, to, to explore the idea that language actually once uh, it has been acquired at a very low, at a lower level than in previous experiments, it could be reused and internalized as a, as a tool to imagine maybe more creative goals. So for example, uh, like when you see a child trying to get an idea of what it could try to draw that, that that's not the usual thing. Uh, it might, might, for example, consider a very standard word, very concrete word uh, they, they've heard in the past and they, they might say, let's combine them uh, uh, in a fun way. Like you combine cat and you can combine bus and it gives them the idea of a, of, of a target for a drawing. So, so actually, uh, as you know, a number of people already had the, this, this idea. So this illustrates one of the processes uh, or that, where language could be used through its combinatorial structure for imagining new stuff that, that, that an, a learning agent may try to do uh, and discover. And so that's really what we actually literally try to do uh, in, in a project called Imagine that we, that we, uh, that we uh, developed 
uh, in the last few years. And so here we have an environment where there is again some kind of uh, agent. So the agent is, is visually represented by this little hand here. So that, that's really visually simple. But, but in a way, still, this environment is a bit like Minecraft. It's, it's a bit like this little hand is like a, the, the character in Minecraft that can go around, uh, pick up objects, and, and mix those objects with other objects in the envir environment to build uh, new materials or to, to produce effects. And so initially, this agent is going to explore a little bit randomly this environment and combine things in a way that's a, a, a bit random. And then there is a simulated social peer uh, which role here is to provide linguistic descriptions of the behavior uh, that are being realized by the agent. And of course, this means that the social peer uh, encodes some form of model of what is salient and, and interesting to describe from, from his perspective. And so initially, the learner will actually explore relatively simple behavior and progressively collect the linguistic descriptions of the social peer. And this is going to be useful for several things. There is first a very kind of very standard things for which it's going to be useful is that through collecting examples of behavioral trajectories associated to a linguistic description, it's going to be able to use that to learn uh, policies enabling this agent to actually achieve uh, a behavior corresponding to those linguistic description uh, in the environment. But actually more generally, what the agent is going to learn is a, is a form of, of model of, of the match between certain linguistic descriptions and behavioral trajectory in the environment. And this may not actually only be useful for uh, generating a behavioral trajectory given in a linguistic sentence. It may also be used for actually measuring later on internally the the achievement of a goal that might be set linguistically later on. And if the social peer is not there anymore, still this learned model might be used to actually assess whether a given trajectory cor could correspond to a linguistic goal. Uh, it could be used as a captioner, for example, given a behavioral trajectory, uh, it, it can enable to generate a linguistic sentence that describes the trajectory. And so in a way that can that can be used as a simulated internal social peer enabling an agent later on, and we'll see the second phase in a few seconds, uh, do things on, on its own uh, uh, when it's alone, when, they, when there is not the social peer. But, but because he has now this little model of what the social peer would say in such a situation, it can generate its own descriptions. And then, of course, it, it's it's kind of a of a small language model which which uh, uh, encodes regularities of of the linguistic description provided by the social peer, and and it's generative and it can be used to generate novel novel sentences uh, that might be used, for example, uh, uh, to, to generate new goals. Uh, and so that's exactly what's happening in the second phase. So in the second phase, the agent it is in the same environment. Uh, but now there is no more social peer. And here the agent is going to be free to generate new goals, new creative goals by actually reusing the compositional properties of language. Maybe in the first phase, for example, uh, the agent observed behaviors that were labeled by the social peer, like as grasp red tree or grasp red algae or grow blue algae. Uh, and now we could say, oh, what if I tried grow red tree? So he's going to recombine those words. Uh, and say, I set that as my goal, and I'm going to try to explore the environment to see whether I'm going to be able to reach that. And what's interesting is that uh, in the first phase, I said that uh, he, he could learn a, a policy, uh, like a system that given a sentence is, is going to generate a behavior corresponding to this sentence. But generalizing to new sentences is, is pretty difficult at the level of the policy. However, uh, 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 something that is a bit more simple to generalize is uh, assessing whether a given trajectory is going to match to a given sentence. And here, this is what we exploit. We exploit this ability to generalize at the level of, of the, the internal measure of goal achievement and to use this to, uh, uh, and to enable the agent to use that to self-reward how much he is good at achieving these new generated goals. And so he's going to be able to generate internal feedback to, to, to evaluate whether he has reached this new self-generated goal and then improve over these new goals that the social peer has actually never uttered and pronounced previously in the environment. 
And then uh, what's also interesting is that even if the agent self-evaluate that he has not managed to reach to reach the self-generated goal, he's also going to be able to reuse the, 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 the captioner learned uh, uh, previously with in interaction with the social peer to relabel the trajectory uh, in such a way that hindsight learning that was that I was describing earlier can be uh, can be possible. Maybe here, he, he, for example, he, he tried to do the goal grow the red tree, and in practice, maybe uh, he, he, what he did is uh, uh, grew uh, the purple tree, and so now he knows how to to grow the purple tree at at least in a particular example. And so by doing this kind of, uh, of, 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 by building this kind of system where language is internalized and used as a tool to generate new goals and to generate self-rewards to award those new goals uh, when the agent is alone, we can actually, in a series of experiments, show that, for example, it enables agents uh, to, uh, to be much better uh, later on in downstream uh, tests uh, that could be given to this kind of agent, like a test set of linguistic goals that were never uttered by the social peer, the social peer, the simulated social peer during the training. Uh, uh, and, so, and so become actually good at doing them, even if the social peer did not did not utter those goals. And this is uh, uh, enabled by the, the agent being able to self train on those new goals without needing the social peer being there. We can show that it's very also efficient in terms of discovering uh, uh, a diversity of new goals uh, across a number of metrics. And we can also uh, observe a number of interesting uh, adaptive behavior. So for example, like uh, here, we have an agent uh, that has learned in interaction uh, with the social peer how to grow animals. So he learned that animals can be grown by giving them food, for example. Uh, and so now we introduce in the environment new objects like plants. He does not know really what are these kind of new objects. And uh, he, 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 um, uh, he has learned with the social peer their name. He knows they are called plants, but he doesn't know what, what, what they can be used for. And so imagine the, the, the goal, maybe I could, I, I could grow the plant and he's going to reuse what he's learned with animals, like providing them food and discover that actually it doesn't work. But, but because he has learned uh, a relatively uh, good uh, internalized uh, goal achievement function, he, he can see it doesn't work and he can also get the feedback from the environment, it doesn't work. And then he's going to, to adapt and to, and to update uh, its skills and to learn that, that yes, uh, plants can be grown, but, but they cannot be grown with, by bringing them food. They, they need to be brought another kind of element like water. And so we, we see very interesting learning dynamics here. Um, and, and, and just very fast as a way to mention, um, uh, in, in these experiments, goals were only uh, uh, expressed in the, in the language space, and then the, the agent directly tried to learn policies to try to reach those goals. But uh, in another related project, what we also considered is the ability to, uh, to map a, a linguistic goal that is generating with the, with the kind of compositional properties I just mentioned be, before, and then uh, from that linguistic goal, imagine with another internal generative model, various visual uh, images that uh, uh, depicting a concrete configuration of the world that would be compatible with these linguistic goals, and, and that would be various ways actually to achieve that goal, uh, va various concrete goals corresponding to these abstract goals, and 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 this ha this can have many advantages actually in environment where. Uh, sometime constraints uh, might, might do that the usual way to achieve a goal is not possible, but you can imagine other concrete ways to do that. Um, okay, but let's let me move to another uh, uh, experiment, which I believe is is quite is quite interesting and important. Is that in the, in the experiment in the Imagine project I just described, uh, as a summary, we had a policy that learned uh, how to achieve goals expressed with language interacting with an external environment. And inside the cognitive architecture of the agent, there were several components. And in particular, for, for the curiosity-driven exploration, you had a component enabling to generate goals. You had a component enabling to relabel the, the produced trajectories, enabling hindsight learning. And you had a component enabling to, uh, uh, to do goal achievement, to generate internal reward, to learn uh, and to update the policy uh, to improve upon the self-generated goals. And so we had a simulated social peer that was providing descriptive linguistic feedback uh, that was progressively internalized in the agent through the model I just described. Uh, 
But a limit of those experiments was that the social peer we were using was really very simplified, especially very simplified in terms of language, which was very like regular and very simple linguistic constructions. And so uh, we began to ask ourselves how could we complexify this so simulated social peer? How, com we com com how could we complexify the language? And how could we complexify the mechanism of, of internalizing uh, such feedback from a, a simulated social peer? And so as a first step to do that, uh, we explore the idea of using uh, large language models as proxies uh, of simulated models of uh, social peers with complex language, and actually directly uh, as proxies of an internalized models of what a social peer would say in particular situation. And so basically the idea here would say, maybe we could use a language model uh, as a cognitive tool in such kind of autotelic agent to help generate new goals, to help, help reliable behavioral trajectories, and to help uh, generate internally reward function uh, uh, as, as a way to help creative exploration uh, to be expressed in more complicated and more sophisticated environment. But as you know, um, uh, uh, language models uh, only play with language. And so if we wanted to play with multimodal environment, we could have used multimodal uh, languages. Uh, some powerful uh, la multimodal language exists, for example, GPT-4 Vision. But as we were, and we are still an academic lab with very limited resources, we'll say, let's say with, uh, let's stay with, with pure language model, uh, but let's, let's use them really in an interactive environment that, that is compatible with dealing only with language, but still we want to have an environment where there is some simulated physics, where there is some causal relationship with, with, between items. And there is a, a family of environment which is very interesting for doing this kind of experiments. And these are textual environments. So textual environments, for those who know, of you you know, uh, there was a whole series of games in the 80s, like the famous Zor games. And these are games which are purely textual. And then it, it goes like, okay, the, 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 the video game tells you in text, you are in the kitchen, uh, on the table, uh, there seems to have uh, this kind of object. Uh, and here there is this kind of object. And your goal is to do this. Uh, what, what, what action do you want to do? And you could do action like enter, uh, uh, take the knife, uh, push on the, of the, on the button uh, uh, of the machine on your right, uh, uh, open the, the door of the cellar uh, or whatever. And actually, the machine learning community in the recent year has been developing a, a whole set of textual interactive environment that is being inspired by those textual video games. And, uh, and so that's everything is in text, but those environments, they really encode uh, an internal logic and internal physics. And it, it really goes and affords for interaction with them where you can have an agent that uh, reads an observation from this environment. Again, saying, for example, uh, uh, you, you are in this situation, you see this and you see that. Uh, uh, and, and here is the set of actions that you may do and those actions are expressed in language. Uh, and, and, and then the agent may choose one of the action and the action is sent to the environment and the environment responds to a new environment by, by a new Ob linguistic observation and there is this sequence of action. And so we use this kind of, ex of textual environments to, to test basically the autotelic agent that is augmented with the language model I described just before. And so typically the way we do that is that, for example, for goal generation, we prompt those language models. So we can use, for example, GPT. And we say, so uh, you, you, uh, you are playing a video game. Uh, you are in env an environment which has these properties. Right now, you are, in a, you are in a state where you see these things. Uh, in the past, you've managed to achieve those goals and those goals. Now your goal is to do this, for example. Uh, what could be the next action you, you can do? And so here, that's, that's using the LLM as a way to suggest action. But if we want to use it to generate new goals, you can say, here are the set of goals you've tried in the past. Here are the set of, of, of success and failures you've had. Uh, could you suggest uh, a, a new idea of a goal you could do in this environment? And so the LLM is able to, to suggest a goal. And then it's going to be sent to the underlying uh, uh, policy uh, traditional policy uh, that's going to use this as an input for the goal, like in the Imagine uh, uh, architecture previously, and that's going to try to, to, to learn to achieve that goal for a while. 
and then it's going to, to produce trajectory in the environment. And again, the LLM is going to be used to label the trajectory and to say whether the goal has been reached or not. And this is going to be used as feedback again that is sent to the to the lower level policy and reinforcement learning algorithm to update its 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 internal representation. And so uh, we did a number of experiments to observe the diversity of achieved goals. And indeed, we can see that by, by using this kind of architecture, the, the, the kind of prior knowledge that in, uh, in the language model is sometimes completely useless and stupid in this kind of environment. But sometimes, and frequently enough, it is useful to the agent to make useful guesses about what uh, what interesting goals or action could be could could be tried and it is sufficiently useful if even if it's very often wrong it is sufficiently sometimes useful to boost exploration so that the diversity of things that are discovered is is way higher uh, than using other forms of more simple more traditional exploration algorithm that would not leverage the kind of structure that are encoded uh, in, in the language model but it was not so satisfactory in, in a way because, because, as I just said, those LLMs, they can often produce wrong suggestions. And actually here, LLMs, they were more used as some kind of external interactive encyclopedia to, encyclopedia to which you can ask suggestions for a goal or for an action to, to be made in the physical environment. And sometimes it's accelerated, sometimes it's it's wrong, and 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 it was, for example, shown to be useful in another experiment uh, from the Google Robotics team in the Seikan uh, project. But in the end, the LLM remained fixed and kind of not really uh, connected to the environment. So in a way, those LLM in this kind of using they they remain completely ungrounded to the environment. What is really lacking in their training to, to be adapted and aligned with the dynamics of the environment uh, is that is, is, is the ability actually to, inter to, to interact with those environments and to make intervention in the environment. They were trained only to predict next words uh, in, in corpuses of text or to achieve textual tasks uh, by getting feedback from humans. Uh, in contexts that have nothing to do with the physics of particular environments, such as those ones in which they, they are being used. And so basically we began to ask ourselves, maybe we could try something more direct uh, to try to, 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 to connect these language models in, in these environments so that they become even more useful as, as, as a tool to organize exploration. And our first step would be to basically explore the idea that LLM maybe should not be used as in the previous uh, project I just described as uh, an external tool to suggest goal or to suggest actions. Maybe they should be used directly as the agent policy interacting with the environment, getting feedback with the environment and updating its internal feedback, its internal representation using that feedback from the environment. And so that's basically what we did in a paper that we um, presented last year, presenting a system called GLAM. And so basically the idea here is that we are still going to, to be playing with an environment that is uh, expressed in text, that is an interactive textual environment, which can be visualized uh, that's inspired from what's called the baby AI environment. So it's it's a little grid world, as you can see on the top here. The agent is represented by, by this little triangle and it moves around. Uh, it can make steps and, and, and turns and it can do various objects, uh, various actions towards objects such as, for example, take an object, uh, uh, toggle the object, uh, uh, drop the object, for example. And so here we have an internal physical simulation of this environment which then it is transposed into a textual representation. And so at each time step, we are going to let the language model observe the environment uh, in form of a text, which is going to see something, for example, you see a wall two steps forward, you see a yellow box two steps left and one step forward, etc., etc. And then the LLM is going to be using this observation to decide for an action also ex expressed here in terms of a sequences of of, of, of words, for example, turn left. And this sequences of, of words is actually sent to the physical simulator of the environment, which is updated the world, updating the world, which is sending back the new description of the environment. And then what we are going to do is that we are going to put this language model 
um, in this environment and, and give this language model a number of goals expressed in language. For example, go to the purple box, pick up uh, the green box, put the, the blue box uh, next to the, the yellow box, pick up the, the purple block, then go to the purple key or unlock the yellow door, for example, which requires to first take a key and, 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 and get to the door. Um, and, and the underlying algorithm we are going to use is a reinforcement learning algorithm. It's, it's PPO. So what's interesting is that on the one hand, it's the same algorithm that's used in many reinforcement learning from human feedback that's used nowadays to train language models, for example, to do good summaries of text. But the very big difference here that when you ask an LLM to train to do summaries of text, you ask the LLM to generate in one go, if you want, a new summary of text, and then get feedback from humans to know, which is subjective feedback, to know whether the, the text is a good summary. Uh, here, what we do is, is, is kind of very different in the sense that we are not having the LLM interacting with the human. We have, have I mean, the LLM interacting with the physical environment. Uh, the human here, the simulated human only gives an objective in terms of, of a linguistic instruction. Uh, and then this is a physical environment who is going to give feedback. And the feedback is not going to go in one go. It's going to be sequential. So it's sequential action and observation. You, you get a goal, you do a, you observe the environment, you do a, an action like go forward and left. Uh, the environment computes the new state of the world, uh, computes the reward, which it gives to the LLM, and then, and then sequences of text like this. And we are going to use reinforcement learning to update lang the language models to uh, actually solve those tasks in this environment. So that's, that's a very different objective and learning dynamics. And so we've been, uh, as a first step, trying to understand the, what kind of, of learning uh, happens or does not happen in this kind of setup. And the first kind of question we've been looking at, for example, is um, uh, what's, what's the sample efficiency of, uh, of, of using those large language models as agent policies as compared, for example, to using a neural architecture that have no prior knowledge of any kind at all. Uh, and so that's what we see here. For example, in the blue curve is the speed of learning how to achieve a variety of goals as compared to, to in, the gray, in the gray curve, for example. It is the, the speed of learning, the same variety of goals with a, a, a neural architecture that is the, the traditional architecture used for this kind of environment that can actually access a richer uh, and better representation of the environment, but that does not have all kinds of, of pre-trained knowledge encoding encoded into the LLM. Um, and so we see that here the, the pre-trained knowledge is very useful, even though the LLM was not never encountered this particular interactive environment. And yet what we observe is that also uh, um, if uh, at the beginning the language model uh, is not so good at solving the task here. Initially, the, the results uh, of the language model that, that we use here to interact and solve those, those problems in the, this environment is very close to random guess. So what's interesting is that it's the, the pre-trained knowledge does not allow zero shot to solve the problem. Actually, it's pretty bad initially, but still it is structured enough so that through learning and exploring the in the environment is going to learn way, way, way faster. And so what's interesting also is that we did some experiments to test various abilities of, of, of this LLM policy to generalize. So what we observe is that, for example, is now you give, uh, you introduce new objects in the environment associated to, uh, uh, to names that were not used in the reinforcement learning uh, uh, process I described before. It's able actually to generalize very well directly uh, um, to instruction like pick up the grid chair, where chair is a new word that was not encountered uh, uh, during training, or go to the red car, where car was not encountered, uh, or even by putting new object with completely invented names, like you introduce a new object, uh, and, and, you, and, and, and the name is Wurst Afte, and you say go to the Wurst Afte, and, and it's in a, in a room where other distractor objects, and right away the the, the LLM is able to uh, to to interpret uh, the linguistic command and actually achieve uh, physically successfully the 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 the, the, the command in this environment. Um, um, but then we also tried the forms of generalization tests. 
um, uh, which did not work. And that's interesting also to see because, um, so for example, we said, okay, what if we try new kinds of combinations of, 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 of goals that, 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 that were not seen during the training? This actually does not work. The LLM is not able to generalize. And so the results are the same as uh, a system that basically knows nothing. Uh, if we give uh, as the set of actions synonyms to the action, like in terms of, uh, for example, uh, 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 move forward, we say move ahead. Again, the LLM is not able to, 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 to generalize what he learned with, with the previous vocab vocabulary. Uh, if we use a different language, like now, for example, we, we say the actions and the goals are in French, again, it doesn't work at all. So interestingly, it means that uh, probably the language model has learned to achieve those linguistically specified uh, uh, goals in this physical environment in a way that is very, very specific to the training conditions. But, it, but then the understanding uh, in quotation mark that uh, he acquired is very limited to these training conditions and the generalization to more various training conditions or, the, or the, the connection to other linguistic structure that were acquired during the, 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 the pre-training, uh, the traditional pre-training that's done by the NLP community before. Also, the connection is very hard to make in many dimensions. In some dimensions, like for example, uh, the lexicon, it appears to, to, to work, but in some other direction, for example, getting to a different language or a different combination, then it doesn't work. So it means that there is a lot here we do not understand very well yet. Uh, I, and I see Stephen is probably asking me to finish. And so I finish right now, uh, just saying that the next step is to try to put back this kind of uh, 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 large foundational model as an agent policy back into the full autotelic curiosity driven learning architecture to try to understand the properties of such systems. And I'm stopping here. Thank you very much, Pierre-Yves, for that extremely long because very rich presentation, even though it was started late. Uh, I hope we'll still have time for some questions and I'll um, I'll start it off with my presidents uh, or whatever uh, privilege I want to ask you something it 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 refers to um the background of all of this in in Luke Steele's uh, talking heads approach to grounding and I wanted to ask you first and this is also stimulated by the original Pierre, uh, um, Luke Steele's results what do you mean? by language. So um, uh, I, I suppose that my first slide illustrated the, that here I have been discussing uh, several meanings of language. Um, in the Talking Heads experiments, uh, the main meaning was was mostly associated to the what I what I call multimodal grounding, which is the the like association between some structure in one modality, which happen to be what we call symbols, to some structures in other modalities. But in the rest of the talk, uh, and, and what I've been trying to uh, focus on through the work on curiosity, I've been actually focusing on another facet, which is considering how a set of structures, which we call symbols, uh, can be actually used functionally as tools to achieve particular tasks in some environments and in particular in cooperation with other agents, but not necessarily always with other agents. As I gave the example that sometimes uh, those structures that we call symbols and those, the systems that make them work, they can be used internally as a, a computational infrastructure that can help uh, an agent to actually solve problems that uh, he wants to solve. I agree that the subject was changed when you moved on to the rest of your work. The original one was supposedly about grounding language, but what it really seems to have been about, if we can, if we take language simply as paired associate learning between uh, between uh, some sort of thing called an object and something some other sort of thing called a word then it was just paired associate learning 
under collaborative conditions where you have to come to an agreement on what your which which word you're going to associate with which object your you, you definitely moved into something that looked like real grounding because all of these later um examples you gave of of uh, basically there was sensory motor or simulated sem sensory motor with robot or with with robots it was real sensory motor interactions between um agents and the world and sometimes also with something we might begin to call words so my second question for you was what do you consider to be a word um I, I guess that a word is a, a, a label that, that's been invented by linguists to organize their scientific discussions. Um, um, uh, and the, the machines actually uh, I am trying to build, they do not, so ideally they do not have a preconcept a preconceptualized notion of a world. So ideally from my perspective, uh, uh, those machines or those models they, they should discover that there are uh, particular um, uh, um, uh, pieces of behavior that enable to produce what externally we like to call words uh, and that they produce as tools to uh, control uh, on the one hand their own thoughts and on the other hand, the external environment. But I guess that actually um, uh, with a rich conceptual system, some of those models and some of those machines, uh, they, they might end up uh, organizing uh, the what we call the language system in a way that might not always be like what we like, the way we like to organize it. And maybe they might not use the 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 the, the unit the, the level of organization of the world as a very important one. In some of the models I, I describe, I, I did a shortcut, of course, to what I just described because uh, because I wanted to focus on some particular scientific questions. But but this is a shortcut, clearly. In the after you left the very first example, when I interrupted you uh, and asked you, do you mean vocalization? It really seemed that the behavior you were talking about could be two kinds. It could be real or simulated robotic interactions between an agent and an object, which is just a behavior, okay? Or it could be um, vocalization as the behavior, right? So I could, uh, I either, I either- Yeah, so- And then, and then somehow the third, I'll, I'll stop in a second. The, the third element came in, which was inherited also from the, uh, from the uh, Stales era, which is, it has something to do with, uh, with communication as well. Oh, so the vocalization, whether it's internal or external, and the task, whether it's verbal, whether it's to say vocal or or a motor, seems to be sort of combined there. And I I I, I see true elements of of what could eventually be considered language and true elements of what could be considered grounding, but they're mixed up in a way that I don't I can't quite follow. But yes. I'm going to stop because no. I'll let you answer me and then I'll I'll pass to the other question. Yeah, so no, but so first of all, that's a great question. Um, um and that was not not very easy to understand for two reasons. One reason is that I went very fast, and the other reason is exactly as you said, they are mixed up, and they are mixed up for a good reason, is that we wanted to have them mixed up. Uh, in a way that we did not want in those models to have a predefined uh, system of symbol, a predefined system that kind of encodes by the hand that this stuff that we call symbol are stuff that either should be used to do something that we call communication. Uh, uh, so the, the whole idea was to have rather an architecture and a world that is all purely sensory motor. No including, notion of a social Including career. the vocalization and the including the internal stuff and including uh, yeah. Yeah, everything. And and from a behavioral point of view, what we observe of, of, of the behavior of those of those of those architecture is that early on in the development in a simulation, for example, at a point in time, for example, you have an agent who is exploring vocalization for the sake of it. 
like internally they set as goal the for example i want to produce an, an audit rate trajectory with this property and they practice but then later on they set as goal um i want uh Uh, uh, for example, the social peer to produce a particular pattern of, of vocal sound. And they are going to use their body and including their vocal tract uh, as, as a means to produce uh, uh, oneself a, a vocal sound. But it's not a go the goal in itself. It's just a means to have the other, the social peer produce that. And, and then later on again, It's going to do the same stuff, but setting as a goal, for example, moving object C that you see here in the screen. And as a result of the learning done before, he will be able to know that if he wants to move object C around, he needs to produce, uh, he needs to get the social peer move around with the hand. And to do that, it needs to, pr to produce a certain patterns of acoustic sounds, uh, which he learned before to produce by, with, uh, by, by practicing them. So it means that, in a way, the agent moved from practicing sound for themselves to discovering that they can use for a certain functionality, which is making the other uh, special object we call a social peer do something special, useful for it. Thank you. Let me pass it. Thank you very much. Let me pass the uh, to, to the next person, François Alizy. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, uh, according to this slide, uh, let me find this slide. Somewhere. Augmenting uh, autotelic agents with LLM. Yes. I have a question about, uh, in the context of uh, augmenting autotelic agents with LLM, how does the system evaluate uh, the eff efficacy of selected uh, trajectories or does the system evaluate the efficacy of selected uh, trajectories? Yes. Do you have an example? Ta question, question n'est pas claire. Dis ça en français, s'il te plaît. Ah, OK. Quand dans, dans le contexte hein, d'augmentation de autotélique, les âges autotéliques hein, dans le langage LLM et comment le système évalue à l'efficacité des trajectoires sélectionnées. Alors, on, on, on évalue, uh, maybe I switch back to English, uh, yeah. we, 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 we evaluate uh, the properties of the skills and trajectories that are discovered in, in multiple dimensions. One dimension is that uh, after the system has explored and learned autonomously in an environment, we introduce a set of new goals uh, that were not given initially. And we test indeed how efficient uh, this agent is at, for example, solving this, the, the, this set of new goals that are expressed in language. And here, in, indeed, we measure a form of efficiency in, in moving in the environment to solve those goals. But another form of evaluation is that we also have measures about the diversity of trajectories, the diversity of goals that are discovered in this environment. Uh, which actually could be uh, beyond what a human evaluator could have in mind uh, when he is going to design a test. Okay, thank you. Jean-Pierre, attends. Uh, déjà, bravo, uh, bravo Pierre-Yves, uh, bonjour. <laughs> bonjour. bonjour. Uh, hello. <laughs> uh, great, great talk as usual. And I, I could see you... you... Ah, the, the 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 progress is very interesting uh, and very uh, very original. Your work on uh, on the uh, on self motivation and using this uh, this LLMs now in your in your framework. My my question is actually uh, more on the the more um, uh, 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 starting. I mean, uh, a fundamental uh, aspect of your of your work, which is about the self motivation, actually autotelic. And which I th I think is is very really fundamental and to 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 let the the soft bots and robots not just uh, follow our orders but be uh, more autonomous. So my my question is about the relation with the exploration exploitation um, uh, dilemma. Uh, let, let's just take a, a quick uh, a quick uh, 
situation in uh, in a human world uh, the, the 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 children they they change very quickly uh, uh, their attention i mean they they they, they skip uh, from one uh, interest to another one this distraction is very is very large when the adults have a different uh, a, a, a different kind of meta control and up to almost like the uh, the, the the Buddha who actually designed some uh, some uh, methods some mind uh, training to 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 retrain the, the attention so my point is that if you uh, the, the, the one of the root of your of your control for the the, the self motivation is the the evaluation of the 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 progress of uh, acquisition of information also the the uh, accuracy of the prediction of uh, of of the the the, the, the action and uh, but I guess you need also some kind of higher level control. Uh, exactly to not to let the 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 agent to get too uh, fragmented and too uh, swapping uh, into uh, different task uh, objectives as soon as another objective gets in and uh, is created and uh, another distraction distraction so how do you how do you incorporate this kind of uh, higher level and uh, larger time scale control for the for for this Okay, so first of all, uh, that's that's very nice to see you, Jean Pierre. Uh, yes, that, yeah, that, <laughs> long time no see, but that that's really that, that that's really nice to see you here. Um, so thanks a lot for your question. Actually, there are, I I can say uh, two, maybe three, uh, very interesting and different questions in your in, in your question. Um, let me start by by the end. So you are completely right. Uh, there is a notion of 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 um, uh, time scale uh, and metacognitive skills that is very important. Um, the the uh, the models that on which we work right now, they 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 are I think model targeting what's happening at I would say at the um, uh, mid term time scale in the sense that that we are we are not really looking at very long time scale organization of learning like for example what humans do when they say uh, 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 maybe my goal is I want to become a doctor or a scientist or whatever which which is a goal they self generate but that's a very long long term goal and that's that it's actually also triggering many difficult questions about how do you get feedback towards progress towards this goal because very often it's very difficult to really measure well how you made feedback to long-term goals. Um, so that's a very fundamental and important question. We we This is part of what we have in mind, uh, but that's not something we, we, we have already strong things right now. Uh, this said, an another dimension of your question is the switching. Um, so um, uh, it, it's completely true that in human, a property of human brains is that there is some kind of switching cost uh, when you go from one activity to another one, uh, it 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 has a cost. It's it's uh, sometimes it's good because like there is an activity you are stuck and uh, going to another one. Uh, when you come back, you are unstuck. But sometimes it's bad because uh, of interferences. Uh, we we are not modeling these aspects in those models so far. We also have them in mind, but we are not modeling. And so in practice, in those models, uh, like robots or agents, they they constantly they constantly shift. Uh, from activities to, to 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 the other one, and those curves they are the the average frequencies, for example. Uh, and so the 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 average frequencies they look smooth, but in practice it's less smooth. Uh, but 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 still, for example, we've done experiments with humans to test some of those hypotheses in works I didn't show today, uh, and and we have activities where we ask humans to explore freely a number of learning activities. They really shift a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's so good for them, but they do really shift a lot. So, so, so on on that side, we are not too too, too far away. Another part of your question is uh, meta exploitation exploitation versus exploration. Um, uh, something uh, that's related to that, I didn't say about about this experiment, but uh, sometimes sometimes when people think about curiosity, they say, but. Uh, uh, that's a strange behavior because, uh, like curiosity, uh, uh, is is uh, is something that is costly, and uh, if if you explore freely your environment, maybe you lose time for the things you need to reproduce. Um, 
and 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 uh, and and that may be especially true for animals who probably are not curious. And, but that's actually wrong, and 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 that's actually we we have a proof of concept of why it's wrong with those models. Uh, so the the idea is that actually, for example, in these experiments, imagine that uh, instead of saying to the robots, explore like you want the environment, set the goals you wish, but you are an engineer, and the only thing you want from this robot is, for example, to find a, a solution to move the ball forward. Hmm. What you would do is you would you would do a reinforcement learning system with a score. Where you would do moving one one centimeter, one point, ten centimeters, ten point, zero centimeters, zero point, and you would use a traditional reinforcement learning system, which is an optimization algorithm that goes through gradient descent. It it tries to find examples of trajectories which gives a little bit of reward and and do comp complicated uh, mathematical computation to 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 know in which direction to modify the policy to improve. The problem is that those gradient-based methods, they work only when you have ex at least a few examples of solutions that do work. Uh, uh, and when they don't have those examples, those, those solutions, they just explore randomly. In this kind of environment, if you explore randomly, like you let the robot do really random movements with the arm, the probability to find a movement that's going to move the yellow ball is, is close to zero. You will wait millions of years before you find this. The only way for the robot to find this is actually to forget about the goal, about the moving the ball, and gets itself interesting in various objectives, which are learnable in the environment. And through the structural coupling due to the physics of the environment, it will end up finding how to move the ball. Now, if you replace the idea of a robot trying to interact with the ball with the idea of a, an animal that needs to find food to survive and reproduce, and you imagine the, the animal is in an environment in which food is very difficult to find. The environment is changing all the time. Genetic, phylogenetic evolution cannot encode a, a robust strategy to find all the time the food. Then what? Should the animal only focus on the food because that's very, very important to pre-produce? Or should be curious? Well, th this kind of simulation shows that Probably it should be curious if you want to have the slight chance to survive. And that's also why we actually observe many kinds of spontaneous exploration behaviors in, in, in many diverse kinds of animals. Uh, we at this time, this point in time, the literature on curiosity of, in animals is very limited, but that's only a limit of our knowledge. But actually, there is many diverse set of of, of exploratory behaviors also in those animals. And, and I, I believe this relates to your question about exploitation exploration in the sense that sometimes uh, being good at maximizing a, an extrinsic reward for a very particular types, which in general you say it's about exploiting, uh, is not the best strategy to, ex to, to be exploitative in the long term. And curiosity can Excellent. be very useful. Excellent. Anything that, uh, that uh, reminds us of animal cognition uh, exists as well, and not if a linguistic uh, human cognition is very relevant. Now, Iris has a question. Thank you. Merci, uh, Pierre-Yves. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Iris. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. My question is going to be quick and general. So curiosity can, is a driver to generate goals in humans, and I was, and, but there are also potentially like other reasons, other drivers behind um goals in humans like interoceptive states like feelings which is a big world um but i was wondering if you considered modeling this in a way to add to the goal generator for the agents yeah so that's a great question so in humans indeed the motivation system is is very rich it has many components uh, including the traditional much more well-known uh, uh, a, a, um, a motivational system, yes, for, for, for getting energy, food, water, uh, uh, sex, uh, social recognition, etc. Uh, and and I, I, I think it's fair to say that at this point in time, uh, our understanding of the interaction of those the various motivational components in humans and in other animals is close to zero. Uh, and uh, we have also a very limited experience uh, of how to combine them in machines. But in machines, still, there are a number of works uh, that try actually to combine them for engineering engineering purposes, actually. Um, uh, so exactly exactly for the same reason I, I just explained. In, in various parts of engineering, people, they want to build machines that solve very practical problems useful in the industry or whatever. And many times, 
uh, like just trying to optimize for those problems doesn't work. Uh, and, and, and that's correspond to the, 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 if you want functionally to finding the food uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the living form. And here there are many papers actually doing what I said before. They really combine those two forms of, of motivation, the kinds of curiosity I have here and the kind of more uh, objective oriented uh, exploration. And they, and they do find it's very efficient. But the way they are combined in this literature is very much based on engineering. So it, it doesn't tell us much about what's happening in, in uh, living forms, if I can say. I don't know if it's actually answering to what you had in mind, but yeah, Veron thank you, Veronique Pazzi. It was a really good uh, talk. Thank you. Um, you. You mentioned something about the the goal because in the the goal, if it is long term, uh, it will be more difficult to to make the algorithm uh, working for the subtask and determine all of the the stuff after. But I, I was just questioning if you have the data, for example, if we are talking about uh, increased sales, increases sales. So you would have the data to confirm that the subtask works in one quarter or half a year or something like that. So maybe it could work if you have the uh, the observation of the, the data that the, the subtask works. Um. Yeah, so may, 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 yeah, I agree. Uh, and also something I was maybe not clear when I discussed long, long, longer term goals earlier is that I was actually thinking also of not only longer term, but more abstract goals. Uh, but for example, uh, many of the of the in, in the, the kind of experiment that on the screen right now, these are sensory motor activities and, and the kind of models we have here, we could apply them very easily to longer time scale sensory motor activities. Like for example, imagine, uh, a human that that wants to practice, maybe he sets of a goal like learning a particular sport or a particular form of uh, uh, crafting skills. And, and for this kind of skill, it's, even if it's long term, there are indeed a number of indicators that they can use for themselves to measure progress and, and that can be used to guide whether they are going to continue being interested and motivated in these skills. Um, uh, it's what, what I had in mind were, were, were more than there are sometimes some longer term goals that are very important for for human life, but but a, a bit wavy. Um, uh, for example, maybe like uh, I, I, people say I, I I'd like to 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 have a, a job uh, that makes me uh, uh, this, uh, help other people be happy. For example. Um, uh, that that's that's uh, that's much more abstract and that, that can be very very important in the life of people and and very important in guiding but at, at this point in time i think we have no really good grasp uh, of of how we could start modeling this kind of uh, interest this is more what i wanted to say mm -hmm. thanks very much on a une, une dernière question maintenant okay, veronique on peut pas continuer parce que Voilà. I'm just saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Parce qu'on a... Des... Et puis, euh, pose la question en français pour que ça aille vite. Salut, alors. Mon nom, c'est Mathieu Gravel. J'avais une question un peu sur la partie de la temporalité qu'on parle. parlait là, par exemple, pour le robot pour Imagine. Dans une type de situation où... Enfin, un plan, eux, qui avaient été des peu génériques et découverts par l'agent. Si, par coïncidence, c'était pour de vrai juste un morceau d'un autre plan plus grand, comme par exemple, pousser un arbre, des actions, puis en le faisant, il y, ouais, les actions, ouais, il y avait découvert le plan qui était, on va dire, trouver de l'eau, après mettre l'eau dans l'arbre, et après mettre de l'engrais dans l'arbre. Est-ce que le système est capable de pouvoir remarquer que pour de vrai, c'était un plus gros plan, non. Ouais, à la fin, puis de les merger ensemble, ou ouais, dans le contexte, ils seraient considérés quand même comme des plans séparés, c'est juste qu'ils ne seraient pas capables de les relier avec, ou qui apprendraient plus tard, ah, je trouve qu'il y a juste une action supplémentaire, mais le deuxième sous-plan serait quand même gardé de côté. Alors, Donc, Oui, c'est une, une très bonne question. Alors, en fait, alors, par exemple, dans cette expérimentation-là précise, il euh, y, a, y, a, y a différentes choses qui se passent. C'est que parfois, effectivement, l'agent, par exemple, il va imaginer un but 
qui est assez compliqué et qui nécessite toute une série d'actions intermédiaires. Et, et peut-être à, à ce stade, au, au début, ce but, il est beaucoup trop difficile pour lui. Il va essayer de le faire. Mais en fait, en essayant différentes choses sur le chemin, il, il va découvrir euh, d'autres choses. Euh, et donc, en fait, le partenaire social ici, il va faire une description linguistique de différentes parties de sa trajectoire. Et donc, en fait, l'agent, il va effectivement être capable de récupérer en même temps euh, des choses qui se passent à différentes échelles de temps de la même trajectoire qu'il a réalisée. Donc, il va être capable de les apprendre. Alors, par contre, en fait, ici, l'architecture sous-jacente qu'on utilise, c'est un réseau de neurones modulaires. Euh, alors, techniquement, c'est ce qui s'appelle un deep set avec de la tension. Euh, bon, ça ressemble un petit peu aux premières générations de transformers. Et euh, ça veut dire qu'en fait, en réalité, ici, il n'y a pas de représentation explicite de la décomposition d'une tâche compliquée en sous tâche Donc, en fait, il va au bout d'un moment apprendre à, à, à réaliser euh, des, des tâches compliquées. Mais euh, si on regarde en interne, il va, on ne va pas pouvoir voir e e effectivement une décomposition en sous tâche C'est plutôt que la, la découverte des sous tâches elle va être plus facile. Et progressivement, ça va amener le réseau à viser ses sous-tâches et à apprendre à les faire. Et en fait, une fois qu'il va, qu va, qu va pouvoir faire ça, il va pouvoir les, les, les séquencer, effectivement. Et en les séquençant, ça va l'amener à avoir plus, plus de chances de découvrir des trucs plus compliqués. Mais une fois qu'il les a découverts, ils vont, si je puis dire, un petit peu comme compiler. Et euh, au final, une fois qu'il qu les a appris, il ne va pas se souvenir de la, de la décomposition. Okay. Très bien. Alors, il, re, il reste pas de temps. Donc, je, je ne peux que te remercier d'être venu ici virtuellement à, à Montréal et puis à euh, cette riche euh, exposé riche que tu nous as fait. Merci beaucoup. Merci, merci beaucoup et merci encore, Steven, pour l'invitation. C'est aussi pour moi un grand plaisir d'être parmi vous. J'accepte le remerciement malgré le fait que je m'appelle Étienne en français. Ah, Étienne, eh bien, je ne le <rire> savais pas et donc je vais, voilà, j'en suis ravi. Merci, Étienne. Merci beaucoup, Étienne. Uh, bye bye. Merci. Au revoir.